Well, good morning. It's great to be with you this morning. If you are a guest, my name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here. And if you haven't picked up one of these journals, I would encourage you to go ahead and do so. And you know, this has been a great journey for the last couple of weeks, hasn't it? Just to take some time every day just to reflect on Scripture. We've had a number of leaders who have written devotionals, daily devotionals uh, in this journal. And three questions really to help start your day and just to think about. Uh, what God has done for us through his son, Jesus Christ. You can pick one of these up there at the Welcome Center. They're completely free. I'd also encourage you, if you have not joined us on a Wednesday evening, why don't you come out this week? You know, over the last two Wednesdays, we've had over 200 people gathering together for a time where we reflect on the weekend message. We, We get in small groups and have discussion about the things that we're learning here on Sunday. And this has been a a rich time, a sweet time. As Pastor Craig told me, you know, it honestly feels like a homecoming. And so if you aren't feeling connected here or you just haven't connected with a group of people, this is a great way to do it. Show up Wednesday. Dinner's at 5.30. Our program starts at 6.30. We'd love to have you. And it's a great way to get connected during this season. Well, this morning we are in the third week of our series entitled The Life of Christ the Lamb. You know, over the past couple of weeks, we've been looking at some pretty heavy stuff, haven't we? Pastor Craig started this series a couple of weeks ago by walking us through the Old Testament sacrificial system found in the book of Leviticus. Together as a church, we looked at the effects of sin, how sin leads to death. We, we know this in our own lives. We've experienced it probably personally in our own lives, but we saw the visceral effects of what our sin does. When we choose to disobey God, when we walk in our own ways, it always leads to less, less than what God has intended for our lives. And we may try to excuse sin or redefine sin, but the consequences of sin always remain. We saw that. Last week, we continued the series by looking at the sacrifice that Jesus made for you and me in Isaiah chapter 53, how he took our place and how he took our punishment for our sin. And for us, friends, this is good news. Well, today we're going to look at some more good news that in addition to taking away our sin, that God loves us enough to redeem us to give us a new standing and to to set us free. You know, our verse for this this series is found in John chapter 1, verse 29. Scripture says this in that verse, The next day John, John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When Pastor Craig taught on this a couple of weeks ago, he said that in the original language, it literally means the one who picked up and took away the sin of the world. Now, I've been thinking about this verse for the past couple of weeks, and I was reminded that I have someone in my life that physically does this for me each and every week. Someone who comes to my house and picks up the things that I don't want, the messes that I make, the smelly things that I don't want, and he takes them away from me. Now, I know this personally because I am the individual in my house that often is collecting these things from all the other rooms and putting them in bags and putting them into a can and wheeling it down to the end of my street where someone else comes and takes those things away from us. Now, when I was a kid, there was actually a a physical person that did this kind of work. We all kind of marveled at him when I was a kid because he had the opportunity to stand on the edge of a truck and hold onto a handle and kind of go as they went down the street. We saw him as kids when we were on our bicycles and we would wave at this guy and we thought he was the coolest thing in the world because he would wave back and we thought maybe one day we can do that. Now we have a robotic arm in my neighborhood that does this work. This truck comes around and picks it up and shakes my can, throws it back down somewhere close to my front yard where I pick it up later that day. It struck me this week that this is the way that Jesus, though, has served you and how Jesus has served me. That in a spiritual sense, this is what the Lamb of God has done for us. Look, the Lamb of God, who has picked up the spiritual garbage of Mike and taken it away. 
You know, I never really thought that taking out the garbage could be a spiritual exercise, but it really can. Over the past couple of weeks, when I've rolled my family's garbage out to the curb, I've taken a moment to pray. I've placed my hands on the garbage can and said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for taking away the filth and the waste that I and my family have created. Thank you for taking it away. And you, Jesus, are more faithful, more faithful than even the sanitation company that comes each and every week right on time to take away my mess. Jesus, the one that picks up and takes away the sin of the world. Today, we're going to continue to work at, look at the work of Jesus in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 17 through 19. We read it before, but I'd like to read it to you again. Scripture says this. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners. Hear in reverent fear, for you know that it is not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. You know, there are a number of truths or principles that we see in this text this morning. But the first one that I want to call your attention to is this, that God calls us to live holy lives with the right motivation. Now, this is a hard pocket, I think, for us to find. A holy life with the right motivation. You see, in verse 16, Peter quotes the command, God's command in Leviticus, be holy because I am holy. And then in verse 17, says that God is an impartial judge and that we should live out our life in reverent fear as foreigners in this world. Now, at first glance, a verse like this might cause a little bit of stress. Maybe you thinking when you, your first thought when you heard that verse was, oh no, what did I do? Or how can I be good enough? Or maybe you're going through your mental kind of Rolodex over the last couple of weeks, and you're thinking about all of the mistakes. Or maybe you just live with a guilty conscience. You struggle with one. Maybe like a little bit like I do. You know, Carla Batch, who serves as our women's director, in addition to doing that, she also serves our community as a magistrate judge here in the greater Pittsburgh area. And she got me really, really well a couple of weeks ago, a number of weeks ago. I was actually working on a project in my office and all of a sudden I got a text message from her and she sent me a picture of a court summons of a man by the name of Michael Patrick Arnold. And then she sent this little, little kind of phrase. You said, oh, the things that come across my desk. Now, that is exactly my full name, Michael Patrick Arnold. And when I first saw this text message, my thought was, oh, no, they got me. I did something. What did I do? And I started thinking through all the things that it could possibly be. Did I pay my property taxes? Did I drive too fast on the way to the church that day? You know, what am I in trouble for? And then I finally paused for a moment and sent her a text back and said, you know, you made my heart skip, beat it, uh, skip a beat. She goes, yeah, I had to check the address too. Make sure it wasn't you. Later that day, I actually took it home to my wife and I showed her a picture of it and said, honey, I got this today. And she looked at me and said, what did you do? <laughs> I was really hoping that her response was going to be, this must be a mistake. <laughs> Knowing you, there's no way that could be you, Mike, Right? The matter of fact is I struggled with a guilty conscience that day. It was not me. To be clear, I was not the one who was being summoned to, to court during that time. But I felt guilty all day long. Even that night when I laid in bed, I was laying there thinking, man, Arnold, you escaped by the skin of your teeth today. I'm like, it wasn't me. Some of us struggle with a, a guilty conscience. And when we hear verses like this about the judgment of God, it makes us tremble in fear. But to be clear, the judgment that Peter is writing about in verse 17 is not about salvation. He is not saying that God is watching us and that he'll kick you out of heaven if you make a mistake. When we give our lives to Jesus Christ, when we yield to him as our Lord and our Savior, our salvation is secure. But as R.C. Sproul writes, the fear that Peter is writing about is one of respect. 
It's like a child who wants to please their parents and wants to live in a way that earns their affirmation. Learn, wants to live in a way to please God. When we do this, when we live in this way with this reverent fear where we want to please God, we should naturally detach our hearts from the world that we live in the day and bond our hearts to him. That's why Peter uses this word foreigners to describe the position of our hearts and how we should live in this world. That even though we walk through the frustrations of our daily lives, that we keep eternity in mind and that we think about eternity and how it impacts the everyday decisions that we make. Peter says that we should live in foreigners in this way and live in a respectful way that pleases our heavenly Father. And we should live holy with the right motivation. The second principle that we see in this text this morning is that we are redeemed by Jesus. We are redeemed by Jesus. Verse 18 says this, For you know that it is not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you are redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. Now this word redeemed is not one that we use in our everyday language today. In the context that Peter is writing, it actually would mean to buy back or pay a ransom. It means covering an unpaid obligation of another person. You see, during Peter's time, there was estimated over 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. Now, often when we think through slavery, we think through an American context. But in this time, it was a little bit different. People didn't amass huge amounts of savings. They often lived hand to mouth. And if they were to fall into poverty, one of the ways that they would provide for themselves is to sell themselves into slavery as a way to survive. They would make themselves a slave of another person. But during this time, it was not terribly uncommon for a generous friend or a family member to have mercy on someone that they loved and to redeem them. That meant paying off their debts and buying them out of the situation that they were in and restoring their freedom and restoring their position in society. So Peter is using this image with his readers and they would have known it, known it. And he says, this is what Jesus has done for us, that we were stuck, that we were captured Maybe we were controlled by the spiritual garbage of our lives, or maybe we were caught in the endless cycle of pursuing an empty, self-absorbed life. And Jesus redeemed us. Friends, he bought us out. And now we can live free with a, a new standing. So in addition to taking our punishment... He is also the Lamb of God that has set us free. He is the one that redeemed us. The third principle I want us to see here this morning is this, that your redemption could not have cost more. Your redemption could not have cost more. Again, in verse 17 and now 18, the scripture says, For you know that it is not with perishable things, such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your ancestors, but, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Peter compares the most precious metals of his day, and he says that they are perishable. The ransom that others would have paid to free their loved ones can, is not enough to pay for the ransom, to pay the debt for you and me. And he says that the only thing that will pay the price, well, friends, it's the most precious thing on this earth, the blood of Jesus Christ. In Romans 3, 23 through 25, Scripture says it this way, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement 
through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. The redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Redeemed. Friends, your redemption could not cost more. The blood of Christ, it is the most precious and valuable thing on this earth. On the spiritual stock market, it is of infinite value. It cannot be bought. It cannot be sold. It only can be given and it only can be received. It will never perish today, tomorrow, or for eternity. And it was given for you. It was given for you. Your redemption could not cost more. So friends, what does this mean for us today? What does this mean in our everyday life? What does it mean for me? Well, the first question I have for you is a question to ponder. Ponder. It's a question that I've been thinking about all week and it's been challenging me. It's been challenging my thoughts. It's been challenging the way that I live. This question is this. How foreign is your life? How foreign is your life? Now that's a challenging question for sure. Peter writes that we should live as foreigners in our world. This means that our ambitions, our dreams, our thoughts, and our lives should be different. We should not allow ourselves to settle into the comfort that is temporary on this earth, but rather we should keep our eyes on eternity. Friends, is there a chance that you've settled in? Is there a chance that rather than a foreigner, that you've begun to look a little more like everyone else on this earth? Think about your dreams. Think about your future plans. Are they the plans of a foreigner? Peter reminds us to stay close to our heavenly father, to be careful not to let our hearts become too attached to this world and to live in a way that gives God glory. This is why this prayer of confession that we've been praying throughout Lent has been so powerful for me. I hope it has been for you. Is your heart attracted to the present delight or to the things of eternity? How foreign is your life? Second challenge I have for us here this morning is this. Don't go back to the garbage. Don't go back to the garbage. You know, when my wife and I were first married, um, one day we, I was washing the car at my parents' house during that time, and my wife and my mom were sitting in lawn chairs watching me wash the car which is a very interesting thing in itself that they weren't helping me wash the car. But they would sit there and maybe drink coffee or whatever and watch lemonade and watch me wash the car and kind of talk to me. I remember one day I was washing the car and spraying down my car and this cat came walking out of nowhere, my parents' backyard, and started walking around my wife's legs. He was purring and loving on my wife. And I kind of saw that cat as I was washing the car. And you know what was coming next. I, I, my wife said, well, who's, whose cat is this? This seems like a really nice cat. And my mom goes, well, that's no one's cat. I've noticed that that's a stray cat that's been walking around our neighborhood. And I began to realize really quickly that that cat would not be stray for long. It was, by the end of the day, it was sleeping on my pillow. It became our cat. She, my wife looked at me and said, I think we should take this cat in. And his name was Zeke. And I think I have a picture of that cat as well for us here today. You can take a look at Zeke. There he is. Everyone always says, oh, when they see a cat. They did that first service as well. Zeke was a great cat. He was actually one of those cats that was half dog. And if you are a cat owner that has had a cat like that, you know what I'm talking about. He would come greet you, let you rub his belly. He loved people. He was a great cat. He is now in cat heaven, if there is such a thing. So he has moved on to eternity for sure. But we loved him and we took him in for that time. Now, for the first few months of having Zeke, he still had a little bit of alley cat in him. He liked to try to get out. 
And so if we opened the door of our apartment that we were living in during that time, if you weren't careful, he would make a run for it. He wanted to run out and run around the fields and chase mice and do the things that he was doing before he became our cat. And so you had to watch him for sure. Well, one day I had some friends over and one of them was not as thoughtful when he came in the door and Zeke got out. We started looking for him, but we couldn't find him. We eventually gave up. But later that day, my wife came home and she would not give up so easily. She said, where's Zeke? And I'm like, oh, he got out. I'm sure he'll come back at some point. And she said, no, we're going to go find him. And so for the next hour or so, we were on a search and rescue for our cat, Zeke. And we started looking for him in every possible way that we could find him. You know, when your animal runs away like this, you try to think like them. Like, you're, I'm, if I'm a cat, where would I go? You know, and so I'm looking in the shrubbery. I'm looking in the woods. I'm looking all around for the places where I thought the cat would go. But about an hour later, my wife found Zeke. And you, you know where he was? He was sitting next to the dumpster. He went back to the garbage. There was a garbage bag next to the dumpster and some trash filled out, maybe some chicken bones or something. He was feasting on the garbage that was sitting there in the parking lot next to the parking lot of our apartment complex. And I tried to tell the cat, you don't have to eat trash anymore. You get a wonderful house to live in and I have wonderful nine lives and some tender vittles and just the right food for you. You can eat good things. You don't need to eat garbage anymore. But he went back to the garbage because that's what he knew. Friends, let this be a reminder. Remember, Jesus picked up the garbage of our lives and he took it away. And we don't have to go back to the garbage anymore in our lives. There's a better alternative. Just like my cat that went to the dumpster, there's a temptation in each and every one of us that when we're stressed, when we're worried, when we're lonely, to go back to the garbage of our lives, but we don't have to. Why would you eat trash when God prepares a gourmet meal? Why would you turn to drugs or alcohol when you're stressed? when you can turn to prayer and reflection? Why would you turn to meaningless relationships when you know you can turn to the one that loves you perfectly? Don't go back. Don't go to the garbage. He has picked it up. He has taken it away. And there is something better. You have been redeemed. A final thought for us here today on how this applies to our life is that I believe the appropriate response is gratitude. You know, when we teach about the sacrifice of Jesus, it invokes a lot of emotions, doesn't it? The price of our sin is ugly. And it's natural for some of us to have a response of guilt. Maybe when you see the cross and what Jesus paid for you and me causes you to hang your head and to maybe think that I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy of a gift. But let me propose that the appropriate response to the sacrifice that our Heavenly Father has made for us is rather one of gratitude than one of guilt. You know, as a parent, I gladly sacrifice for my kids. I have two daughters, and I love to sacrifice and give to them. Now, sometimes it's hard. I have two daughters that play club volleyball. And so any of you who have paid for this club sports for your kids know that it is a sacrifice, a sacrifice of time, money, of energy, basically a sacrifice of your life for your kids to pursue the dreams that they have on the court or the field that they play on. But I gladly do it. I want to see them achieve their dreams. They have joy when they're playing volleyball. And I like to see them have that joy. Matter of fact, there's really no other place I'd rather be than sitting on the side of the court watching my girls play their hardest on a game of volleyball. And if I am an pr- imperfect father that truly loves his kids imperfectly, I don't do it perfectly. I imagine the same is true when it comes to our Heavenly Father. He loves you perfectly. 
You know, as a, as a father, when I sacrifice for my kids, I don't want them to feel guilty. My oldest just qualified for nationals in volleyball, which is a pretty neat thing that our team qualified for the national level tournament, which is exciting. And we celebrated with her uh, last weekend. But then this weekend, I went and bought airline tickets and hotel fees and started paying the price. That would be a sacrifice. And I'm like, okay, the things that I want get pushed off a little bit further, a little bit further <laughs> than I wanted them. But I made that sacrifice. You know, the response I, have, I want from my daughter is not, oh, dad, I'm sorry that you have to sacrifice. I don't want her to say that. All I want is every once in a while for my daughter to look at me and go, dad, I see the sacrifice that you and mom make for me. You know what? Thank you. Thank you. It'd be really nice if they gave me a hug as well. I'd like that. I'd take that as well. They're teenagers. Those come by a lot less often than they did when they're little, right? But thank you. And I imagine the same is true when it comes to our Heavenly Father as well, who loves us perfectly. When we reflect on the cross and the sacrifice that Jesus made for you, I believe the only appropriate response is to look at our Heavenly Father and say, thank you. Thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you for paying the price to redeem me. Thank you for freeing me from the empty way of life or the garbage pit that I have created. Thank you for redeeming me. You know, when you see a picture of redemption, it's a beautiful thing, isn't it? When you see God doing this in individuals' lives, well, for me, it honestly, there's few things that get me more excited. I get pumped. It's like being at a sporting event. When I see God redeeming someone, I'm like, yes, way to go. Because it's beautiful when you see God doing this. One of our ministry partners, Unaltered Ministries, which was formerly called the Silver Ring Thing, many of you know, was started by Denny Patton here in our church. Over the last two years, though, they've had to significantly shift their ministry model as COVID shut down many of their tour and event schedules. Jason Burt, who's their current lead, shifted their model because of this and is creating a three-month experience for young adults during a gap year between high school and whatever is next for their lives. During this time, young adults come and they're exposed to different ministries and career paths nonprofits and jobs in the marketplace, and they're giving a place where they can explore what God would have for them next. I have personally had the opportunity to share with some of the unaltered missionaries, and it was really refreshing to see what God was teaching them and how he was molding their lives. Pastor Craig has had the opportunity to share as well. Todd is one of these young adults. And in this video, it gives us a glimpse of what redemption looks like. What it looks like in someone's heart, in someone's life. And God takes them from the garbage that they were trapped in, or an empty way of life, and redeems them. Take a look at this video. Yep. Three, two, one. So all my life, I've always struggled with not feeling like I was enough. I spent most of my, most of my childhood realizing that I would never reach this idea of perfection that I had in, in my head. Uh, I began valuing the opinions of others so much that it led me down a path of, of sin and destruction. If I had to describe my story in in just like in just two words, I would say prodigal son. Uh, I grew up a pastor's kid, going to church every Sunday. I knew the gospel. I knew all the stories. Uh, I knew Jesus had come to die for our sins and paid that debt for us. But still, I had this like weight of of like perfection hanging over me that I just knew I could never be enough. I tried over and over again to follow Jesus. And every time I fell short of that standard, uh, I gave my life to Him more times than I can even count. All these professions of faith, because I just always knew I was I was not enough. 
And eventually I realized I could never reach that standard and it led me to falling further and further away from the Lord until the point to where I just didn't try anymore. It was like I just felt hopeless that this weight of perfection hanging over me that I could never live up to. Uh, so, I, so I ran. Uh, I ran away from everything that I was taught, everything that I knew was good for me, everything that God wanted for me, and I began to chase uh, the pleasures of, of the world. I fell into a world of, of sex, trying drugs, drinking alcohol, basically just wanting to win the approvals of others while also looking for just a good feeling to make me feel better about myself, trying to be that guy that everybody looks up to. But every time I went to a party or, or spent the night with a girl, it always just left me feeling the same way. It left me feeling empty. So after years and years of chasing perfection and every time falling short, I finally came to the point where I realized that I would never be enough and that I couldn't figure it out on my own and that without Jesus, I could never reach that, that idea that I had in my head. I felt like I was the prodigal son. Uh, I had ran away from my father, took the inheritance that he gave me and was just squandering it, living amongst the pigs. Uh, but the whole time he was waiting there with open arms, just waiting for me to take the first step. I would cry out to him like, God, take this away from me, just like take over. But I was never willing to, to give up the things I was doing. And he really, he was just waiting for me to turn back to him and he was there the whole time. He started to reveal to me that, I mean, just look at all the heroes in the Bible that we look up to. He used those broken, imperfect people that didn't have it all figured out to accomplish his plans. He uses our weakness to sh show how strong and powerful he is. He uses weak people to show his strength. And I still don't know how God is gonna use me in his kingdom, and I'm just learning to be okay with that. That's the whole reason I came to the Unaltered Life through, throughout my time here already. I'm learning that my assurance in my salvation doesn't come from being perfect or having it all figured out or being able to follow all these rules or having my own plans. It comes from a daily pursuit of a relationship with Christ and learning more about Him and learning to love Him more and learning about His love. I've learned that true freedom is never going to come from other worldly things or your own preferences or the, the idea that you have for your own life, but just surrendering to His unaltered design in the way that God created us to be. Isn't that beautiful? Mm. It's so exciting to see what it looks like when God begins to redeem a life. So how about you? Jesus, the Lamb of God, the one who redeems. What will be your response here this morning to the one who has been so generous and so good to you. I invite you to bow your heads and pray now. So I lead us through a response of prayer this morning to the incredible gift that God has given us. You know, maybe you're here today, and if you're honest, you've never received that gift. Maybe you've tried to earn your redemption. Roll up your own sleeves and do it on your own. Today, will you receive it? It is too big of a debt for any one of us to pay. It can't be bought. It can't be paid. It can only be received from the work of Jesus Christ. If that is you here today, will you simply pray? Ask the Lord to come into your heart here this morning for Jesus to fill your heart and to fill your soul. Yield your life to Jesus today and choose to follow him as your Lord, as you make him your Savior today. Maybe you're here today and you've done that. But if you're honest, you keep going back to the garbage again and again. When you're stressed or when you're lonely, you go back to the old things, the trash 
and you go to those things for escape, if that is you this morning, will you take a moment right now and just confess that to our Lord? God, I confess that I go back to those things, the garbage that you picked up and that you took away. And today I commit that I will go to you. Those moments when I'm lonely or insecure or worried or stressed, I will go to you to find peace in my life. Maybe you're here today. And whenever this time of year comes around, your response is guilt. When you see the cross and the price that Christ paid, your response is, I'm not worth that. I don't want to see that. I'm not good enough for that. Will your response be one of gratitude? Will you simply just say to our Heavenly Father, the words that he wants. He loves you. He cares for you. He gladly sacrifices for you like a perfect father. Will you simply say, thank you. Jesus, we are grateful for the sacrifice that you made for each and every one of us, for the price you paid to set us free, for the price that you paid to redeem us. Father God, thank you.